welcome to the concepts video on domain and range. So functions model uh, the real world, or things in the real world, um, and just as there are limitations to things in real life, uh, there must be appropriate limitations uh, with regards to our functions too, or function or functions, right? Uh, and specifically with reference to the inputs and the outputs that we have, like our independent variable and our dependent variable for our functions. So basically the variables involved. So uh, here's an example. So let's say when we talk about uh, the volume of a cube, okay? So let's use this as an, as an example. So volume of a cube. All right. So the formula for the volume of a cube is, uh, let's say, okay, so here's our cube. All righty. So here we have a cube, and let's say it has side length of s, all right? So s, s, um, and here's another s, okay? So here's our cube, and the area, for, or sorry, not, not the area, the volume formula. So v is equal to s cubed, right? And that makes sense because we have a cube. Anyways, so a, or sorry, I keep saying a. Uh, v, our volume, is equal to the side length cubed. That's how we get the volume of our cube, okay? Um, but the thing is that physically, we can't have a negative side length, right? That would be really, I don't, I don't believe that's possible. <laughs> so physically, uh, our s, our s cannot um, be less than or even equal to zero, right? Because even if our side length was equal to zero, that means we uh, we don't have a cube. We don't have anything at all, right? We just have like a point or something, not even a point. I don't know. That, that's just a really strange situation. Uh, and definitely our side length can't be negative because th what, what does that even mean um, physically, in a physical sense, right? So that means that a reasonable restriction uh, that we could have on our side length is the following. S is greater than zero, Right? And that doesn't mean it has to be an integer like greater than zero, like one. It could be like 0.5, like of whatever units we're going to use. But anyways, it just has to be greater than zero. Okay? So what this this is, is that, so well, v, first of all, so v is our output, right? That is our uh, dependent variable, dependent variable, whereas s is our input, that's our independent variable, right? Okay. So here, this s being greater than zero, this is a restriction that we've set uh, based on what s means in a physical sense. Okay, so this restriction, so restriction or limitation, we could say, or limitations um, of or on uh, our independent, I'll abbreviate, our independent variable, this leads to what's called our domain. Okay, and let me define what a domain is. It's kind of similar to that. So domain basically means the following. So domain, let me make sure the I is there. So domain is equal to the set of possible uh, input values to a function, to a uh, function, okay? Basically, what can you make your independent variable be? What What is it allowed to be, okay? Whereas... Uh, let's say, okay, so let's continue this example on the next slide, all right, about the, the volume of the cube. So here's our v is equal to s cubed, right? So we already set this restriction or this limitation um, to guide our problem in a physical sense, right? So side length is greater than zero. So what does that mean for our v? That means that uh, because our s isn't allowed to be equal to zero or a negative number, that means our v, our volume also, must be greater than zero depending on, because that depended on what our s was allowed to be, okay? So in this sense, when we have, um, this, this defines our, what's called our range, okay? Let me just show you guys what that means. So that would be, uh, conversely, the set of possible output values you can get, basically. So possible output values, um, of a function. Okay, so this is the, uh, this has to do with the dependent variable, right? So in this case, our dependent variable is volume, or V. Um, and so the important thing to note here is that because domain, so I'll just write domain corresponds to the independent variable, right? And range corresponds to the, what the dependent variable can be, okay? And it's still, 
follows here that r, our range, depends on what our domain is, right? So in this case, like, because s wasn't allowed to equal zero at all, our v couldn't be equal to zero, and it can't be negative either, because s can't be negative. So this depends on that, okay? So because of that uh, relationship between domain and range, because uh, they're related also with the whole dependent independent variable thing, um, what I like to do is figure out the domain of a function first. So let me just write a little note. So um, figure out, if, if the question asks that is, figure out domain of a function, domain of a function first. And it's just a good exercise too, just in case like in the future, you're ever looking at um, some function or you're faced with some function in a problem, it's good to um, clarify what the domain is, okay? Because that's always an important part. So once you figure out the domain, um, and then, and then you can figure out, you can figure out the range depending on that domain, okay? All right, so let's do an example um, using domain and range, okay? Okay, so we have the population of a small town in the year 1960 was 100 people. Since then, the population has grown to 1,400 people reported during the 2010 census. Choose descriptive variables for your input and output and use interval notation, which we haven't learned yet, but we'll get to that, to write the domain and range. So let's just uh, make some sense of what this problem is even saying. So in 1960, so in the year, year 1960, that corresponded to a population of 100 people, okay? And then uh, it says, since then, population has grown to 1,400 people, okay? And then this was reported during the 2010 census. So this, is, this corresponds to the year 2010, right? Okay, so we have these two different, like, kind of markers. They're kind of like points. In the year 1960, we had population of 100. In the year 2010, we have population of 1,400 now, okay? So we're going to choose descriptive variables for our input and output. So input would be, in this case, our year, okay? So y is going to be equal to year, let's say, okay? And then uh, let's say for, for this variable here, we use p for population, okay? So population here. And as I've already suggested, by the direction of the arrow, um, the year, well, the population depends on the year it was, okay? So population depends on time, depends on, uh, I'll just put time here, but that just means like the year it is, okay? So this means that our year is like our input, so that means this is the independent variable, and population is consequently the dependent variable. All right, so how would we, so domain corresponds to um, the set of possible input values we could have, right? So domain in this case, so we're going to use interval notation, it says, which again, we haven't learned that yet, but we'll build to it, okay, to write the domain and range. So let's write domain and range as we can right now, as we're uh, equipped to write it. So domain basically means, okay, so given these two points, we went from 1960 to 2010, right? That's where the year ranged from. So this, we could write it as an inequality, right? So y goes in between and equals 1960 and 2010. And something important to note is that we do have these uh, equals or equal to, because we have less than or equal to, right? The or equal to part means that you include the endpoints, okay? And that means 1960, the year 1960 is included, and as well as the year 2010, okay? Um, so if we didn't want to include those, we just get rid of the or equal to um, symbols underneath, okay? And now let's look at our range. So our range has to do with what uh, the set of possible output values we could get from our function, right? And that would just be, again, we'll write an inequality. So P is in the middle. That means our population. And it ranged from, ne from 100 up to 1,400, including those values, right? So we have to have less than or equal to because it was equal to at a certain point. And then uh, P is less than or equal to 1,400 here, okay? So this, these are our domain this is our domain and a range, okay? And this is in terms of inequality form, okay? So let me write that in plain English. So inequality form, all right? This is the, uh, I'll just call it format, or the way you can write your domain and range, which is perfectly fine. But now um, we'll explore on future slides. So now we're going to 
show other ways to write to write domain and range. Okay, domain and range. All right. So the first way, uh, like I listed before, is inequality. Inequality. Let me show the example of that. So our D was given by uh, 1960 less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to 2010. And range was um, P is greater than or equal to 100, but less than or equal to 1400. Okay, so that was the inequality form. And now I'll introduce what is called set builder. Kind of a funny name, right? So set builder notation. Okay, so basically all you have to do is write your inequality down. So we just copy it down. Okay, so the domain again is going to be 1960 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 2010. And then what you do is you stick curly brackets, kind of thing, fancy brackets I call them. But um, anyways, curly brackets around the outside. You leave a little bit of space in front because what we're going to do is write the variable that's involved. So that would be in this case y. So you write the y and then you just write this random like vertical line thing. Okay? And that's it. That's how you build your set with using set builder notation. So let's do the same thing for r. So we just copy down our inequality. 100 is less than or equal to p is less than or equal to 1400. We write our curly brackets on the outside. We leave a little bit more space in the front. We just copy down that variable, whatever we're using in our inequality, and we stick this vertical sign there. And we're done. That's it for set builder notation, okay? All right. So now onto the interesting one, or the, well, I mean, arguably more interesting one, interval notation. And this is definitely uh, the most commonly used, I would say, okay? So, um, yeah, whether you want to or not, you're going to be become familiar with interval notation. So the thing here is what we're going to do is take the inequality uh, and turn translate, like, the symbols, like the inequality symbols, into brackets slash parentheses, okay? So in this sense, what we have is, um, let me just write down what we had before, okay? So 1960 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 2010. This is just for show, um, demonstrative purposes where this is not the interval notation. Obviously, this is just the inequality. But anyway, so what we're going to do is take all of these. We're just going to take the two endpoint values, okay? You just write those down. So 1960 and 2010, you separate them by a comma. Okay, so that's it. And then we just have to figure out what has to, what kind of um, things have to go on the ends, what symbols. And the way you tell is uh, you see, okay, so we have a less than or equal to sign. So that means that we're going to have square brackets, okay? And these are like the, they look like squares, right? Um, so anyways, and we also have one here, a less than or equal to sign there, okay? So square brackets means you include the endpoints, okay? So square brackets means you include endpoints. Include endpoints, okay? All right, and then we'll do the same thing. So this is our domain here. This this right here is our interval notation, okay? And then let's do the same thing for our range. So range, let's just look back at this inequality here. So we're going to write down the two endpoints. So 100, comma, 1400. And if we have or equal two things here, we're just going to use those square brackets, okay? Alrighty, so that would be it in interval notation. And let's just do, um, I'm just going to do an example on the next slide to show you what you would do if you don't have the or equal to part. Okay, so let's say we have, this is an example. Okay, so let's say we have 2 is less than k is less than 4. Okay, so here what we would do is write down the endpoints, 2 comma 4, but this time we do not have the or equal to's under, underneath, right? So in this case, we're going to use what are called rounded braces or whatever, aka parentheses, okay? So rounded means that endpoints are not included. Endpoints not included. All right, let's do one more little mini example here just to clarify what, what's going on. So let's say we have the following interval, right, or the following inequality, that is. Now let's write this in interval notation, okay? So this would be, we're just going to copy down those endpoints, and then we see, okay, so this guy doesn't have an or equal to, so he gets a rounded bracket, okay, on the left side. And then on the right side, though, this one does have an or equal to, so that one gets a square bracket. So they don't have to match up. They don't have to both be round or both be square. They can be whatever um, is fitting for the problem, okay? Alrighty. <laughs> Thank you.